We're live. Hey guys, we're live. Okay. We're officially live. Anybody that is watching or tuning into the stream now, welcome to our Bible study. Um, we are not yet set up to hear everybody's questions in the room. However, everybody is okay with you hearing their questions. So hopefully next week we'll have a microphone in the room so you can hear everybody's questions throughout the study. But this week I'm going to try and repeat them so that you guys can hear the questions. Um, I don't have anybody staffing the chat. So if you're in chat and you have any questions, I won't see them until after the Bible study is over, unfortunately. So I won't get to answer those. But we'll try and fix that in the following weeks coming up. So. But welcome to the study. So with that, guys, um, we are continuing. This is part two of the Trinity. Last week we were talking about the doctrine of the Trinity, what the Bible says about it, um, and all that stuff. Because one, that question comes up a lot. Um, the Trinity is something that is often debated. Uh, it is denied by all of the cults. Not a single cult out there um, believes in what the Bible says about the Trinity. They believe all kinds of erroneous things about it. So what I want to do this week, since we're actually finishing up, is I want to just quickly recap last week's stuff, okay? Um, if you weren't here last week because we actually filmed the Bible study, it's on YouTube. So you can actually go look, watch it if you want to. Um, but uh, it started out with this idea yeah. that, that defining God and who he is is very difficult, okay? It's a very, very difficult thing to do because he's God, okay? We have finite intelligence. We have finite minds. God is infinite. All right. God is all knowing, omnipotent, almighty. And so trying to define him um, on one hand is an impossible task. He, however, God has revealed himself in his word to a degree that we can understand who he was, who, who he is. And he's also uh, revealed his nature and, and really what what he is, who he is, and all that stuff. And a part of his nature is the fact of the Trinity. It's something that the Bible teaches very clearly. It's something that is supported scripturally. Um, and again, it is, a, it is a foundational thing to our faith. And I'm going to kind of close on that point tonight when we get there. But uh, who remembers what the definition of the Trinity is? Yes, that's a fantastic definition. Yeah. The Bible teaches that there is one God. There is one God in all creation, all time, all places. Only one God. The, the Bible is very clear about that point. But it is also clear that this one God exists as three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, the important understanding of that is it isn't one God who's just kind of manifested in three different forms, okay? Um, that's not it. They are distinct. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons. And so, are we good? Okay, cool. Um, they're distinct persons. And we, and we talked about a little bit. I'm going to just, you know, recap that real quick. But we started with this understanding that in order to look into God's word and try and get an understanding of what the Trinity is, what God's nature is, there is this verse in Romans chapter 1, verse 20 that says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been understood and observed by what he made so that people are without excuse. So that was the verse we, we kind of launched from, saying that, Right there in God's word, it says that we could look at creation. We could look at what God made to try and get an understanding of who God is. All right. Because his, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and his divine nature are, it says, understood and observed by what he made. And so if you guys remember, we looked at um, these three kind of um, points about the universe, meaning like all of creation is made up of, of three things, time, space and matter. Right. And so we looked at time just like if we're looking at God's creation and going, can we observe God's nature in this? We looked at time as an example of one thing existing with three distinct things within it, right? Time has past, present, and future. Past, present, and future are not the same thing. They are distinctly different from each other, but all three together are essentially time, right? They share the same nature. They are one thing, time. We looked at space. Height, width, and depth, right? Distinctly different, yet they are all space. And then we looked at matter. All matter is comprised of either solid, liquid, or gas. 
distinctly different, but they are all matter. It's not three matters, three spaces, three times. They they are one, but there are three distinct, um, uh, um, distinctly different parts to them. And so that was us endeavoring to look at creation and observe and understand God's nature through what he made. Now, um, I, I do believe that none of those are perfect. None of those are sufficient to explain God's nature. But in his what God has revealed to us, I, I think they're a, a pretty good understanding of how the Trinity can exist. Because that's one of the points that the cults refute. It doesn't make any sense. There's no possible way something could be one and three at the same thing. Well, then you go, well, look at time, look at matter, look at space, you know. And incidentally, um, science has discovered that there's a point where water, like because water could be solid, ice cube, it can be vapor, and it could be liquid, right? And there's a point, I forget, there's some scientific term for it, but there's a point where water exists as all three simultaneously, which is kind of interesting because then you go, that can't, well, it, if it can't happen, it, it, it can. We, it's observable in nature. So anyways... Moving on from that, um, we, we touched on the fact that, you know, from Isaiah 43.10 and Isaiah 44.6, among many other verses, where the Bible is very clear that there's only one God. All right, Isaiah 43.10 says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and trust me and understand that I am the one. Before me, no God was formed, nor, were the, where, nor will there be after me. So there's verses like that all through the Bible that establish that there is one God. In the Bible, it's very clear. There's one God. There's not three gods, okay, which some cults go, oh, the Trinity is three separate gods. No, there's one God, all right? But then from there, we looked at the Bible calls the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, calls all three of those God in Scripture, okay? And we, we looked at a bunch of Scriptures of that. We're not going to go through them all again. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in different places in God's Holy Word are called God. <laughs> not separate gods, but God. And again, we go, the Bible says that there is one God. And so the Father is called God. The Son is called God. The Holy Spirit is called God. We looked at um, some of the Scriptures where all three of them are called the Creator, okay? The Creator of all things. Um, all three of them are said scripturally to resurrect, all right, to have resurrection power. And, but before you, you look at those things and go modalism, that's just one God appearing as three different forms. We looked at the, what the Bible says about the triune nature of God. Looking at obviously in Genesis chapter one, where it says, uh, chapter one, verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image to be like us. All right. Um, can you stop the dishwasher that is making those radically noisy noises? So in Genesis 1 there, the term is Elohim, which, was, which is a Hebrew word um, that, that basically is a singular word referencing plurality. All right? Um, it's not a plural word referencing plurality. It's not a single word referencing singleness. It's a, sing, it's a single word referencing plurality. And so when God is called Elohim, it's saying he's one God but three persons. All right? So, um, and then obviously we looked at the example in the New Testament of the baptism of Jesus Christ, right? For those that say, oh, the Trinity is just one God appearing as different forms at different times. I hit cancel. Hit it again just to make sure. <coughs> Sorry, guys, my dishwasher is really loud. And shouldn't be running during Bible study anyways, but whatever. So, yeah, I know, right? Something's in there. So anyways, the, the, at the baptism of Jesus, we see all three elements of the Trinity appearing simultaneously, right? We see God the Father speaking from heaven as, as God the Son comes up out of the water in baptism, and we see God the Holy Spirit descending on him in the form of a dove. And so that kind of shoots out of the whole, shoots out of the water the whole like, oh, God just appeared on this occasion as a father and appeared on this occasion as a son and appeared on this occasion as the Holy Spirit, because right there... All three are there present. All right. So that kind of shoots modalism out of the water. Um, and then, of course, we looked at uh, John chapter 14, which I encourage you to go through and read again, where throughout that whole chapter, Jesus is referring to the Father as another entity. 
he refers to the Holy Spirit as a as an entity, another identity. Okay, the Father is another identity, the Holy Spirit is another identity. And yet at the same time, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because I and the Father are one. All right. So chapter 14 is kind of a whole speech about the reality of the Trinity, if you will, right from the mouth of Christ himself. And uh, and then this is where we got to last week. And so um, I know I say this a lot, but we may end early tonight because this is kind of the last part of the study. But every time I say that, we go a whole hour. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> However, the definition of the Trinity, there is one God existing as three persons simultaneously, right? Three, not two, three. Um, but what does that word person mean? When, when we say that there are three persons, what do we mean by that phrase? Now, if I asked you guys, what do you mean by the word person? Or if I said, what is personhood? What would you guys say to that? How would you answer that question? How do you define that somebody is a person? Living, breathing, has thoughts. Okay. Living, breathing, has thoughts. Self-awareness. Self-awareness. Personality. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Well, those are good. And yeah, those are on my list. You know, things like self-awareness, identity, like I know who I am, um, can speak, has feelings, can love, can hate. All right. Um, can grieve. Um, a person can say things like you your, mine, we, us, you know, can say things like that. Um, a person also has a will of their own. Okay. They have, they have a will, a, a, a desire, an intention, a, a decision-making faculty to choose things and possesses intelligence. All right. These are things that, that, that define personhood, you know, um, like one of the cults, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the Holy Spirit is, is not, it is just an energy is just the 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 essence of god's will that's what they teach the holy spirit is right like nothing more than the electricity in the wall that makes this light turn on and yet you wouldn't say that the electricity in the wall here has intelligence would you <laughs> or it might rise up and try and destroy us you know um you wouldn't say it has feelings right you know you flip the light switch off and it's like oh come on you know <laughs> No, it's, it's just an energy, right? And Jehovah's Witnesses teach that that's what the Holy Spirit is, and yet that's not supported by Scripture, because as I'm going to show you, the Holy Spirit possesses intelligence, possesses feeling, has a will, can speak, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you can grieve the Holy Spirit. Right, and that's one of the verses I'm going to share with you guys that prove that the, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is indeed a person. Now, obviously, uh, Jesus, that's, that's an easy one for us to understand. He's a person because he was here physically. And so the whole gospel accounts are about him and his life here and all that. And yet um, the father is also referenced with all these things that give personhood. And so when we say the Trinity is one God existing through all creation, all time and all places, existing simultaneously as three persons that are distinct from one another. They're not just different forms of one person, but they are distinctly different persons. When we say that term persons, um, this is what we're going to be looking at tonight. So if you want to get back into the fact that they are individually referenced as creator and individually referenced as, as resurrection, all that, um, go back and watch last week's study. But um, for the sake of today, Let's look at this whole idea of one, but existing as three persons. And so, as we were talking about the attributes of personhood. So the first one I want to look at is intelligence. Okay. Does the Father, does the Son, and does the Holy Spirit, do they individually possess intelligence, which is an attribute of personhood? Well, um, take notes here if you're writing these down. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, it speaks of the Father possessing intelligence. It says... If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows everything. Yes. That was 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. So who knows everything there? Right. When you're looking in Scripture and in talking about the Trinity and stuff, when it just says God, 
it's referencing God, but most often referencing God in the context of God the Father. Okay, when the Son or the Spirit are referenced, they are often referenced as the Son or the, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so right there, 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows everything. So he possesses intelligence, but not only that, as God possesses, um, what is the word, omnipotence, all-knowing, right? <laughs> I have dogs here too, and they've decided to choose right now to play. So knock it off, dogs. Okay, good. Okay, so we looked at the father possessing intelligence. Then in John chapter 16, verse 30, we see that the son possesses intelligence. Now that's an easy one. Obviously, you can read the gospels and there's many other scriptures, but it says the disciples were speaking and they say, they're talking to Jesus. They say, now we know that you know everything and don't need to have anyone ask you any questions. Because of this, we believe that you have come from God. So what was happening there, they were like, we get it. We know you know everything. Okay. So, and obviously he was a, um, Jesus was the, the one person of the Trinity that, that, had a dual nature, if you will. They call it the, uh, um, I think I might butcher this, the hypostatic union. I think that's what it's called. There's some fancy theological term for it. But basically, Jesus was fully God and fully human at the same time, okay? And he's the only person in the Trinity that had this dual nature. And so, um, anyways, they're referencing him there. Obviously, they're like, you, you know everything. And then, the Holy Spirit having intelligence. And this is the one that, that specifically will deal with uh, if you talk with Jehovah's Witnesses or those that, that deny the personhood of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11. It says, But God has revealed those things to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the deep things of God. Is there anyone who can understand his own thoughts except his own inner spirit? In the same way, nobody can know the thoughts of God except God's Spirit. Right? The Spirit knows all things. So, that's intelligence. All right. Let's look at, does the Bible display that the Father, Son, and the Spirit have a will of their own? Okay, individually, as individual distinct persons. Well, in Luke chapter 22, verse 42... It shows us that not only does the Father, but the Son, they both have their own will. Because Jesus says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. So we saw right there that the Father has a will, and the Son has a will. Because the Son's going, yo, Dad, don't really want to do this. But not my will. Meaning, I have a will of my own, but I will submit my will to your will, Father. Okay, so we see that right there in that one verse. And then uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, this is where we see that the Holy Spirit has a will of its own. It says, But one and the same Spirit produces all of these results and gives what he wants to each person. If the Holy Spirit was just electricity in the wall, how could it be called he, and how could it decide to give, and it's referencing spiritual gifts to people? So that scripture right there telling us that the Holy Spirit has a will. And on top of that, it's he's called he there, okay, given given a direct, um, what is it, a pronoun referencing personhood. Yeah. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, okay? Now, there are more scriptures in these guys, you know, but I didn't want to scripture you to death. You know, I just wanted to give you a, a, a place to kind of launch from and study it on your own and, and dig through these things as well. So we looked at intelligence. All three have intelligence which is a attribute of personhood. All three have a will of their own, which is an attribute of personhood. And all three can love, okay? In John 3, 16, right? The famous verse, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his unique son so that everyone who believes in him might not be lost but have eternal life. That's the ISV or International Standard Version translation, okay? So for those of you that were like, that's not what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, same verse. But this is how God loved the world, and it's referencing the Father. The Father gave his Son. Okay, um, the Son can love as a distinct person in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It tells us this, Husbands, 
Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay. So we see that the father can love, which is an attribute of personhood. We see that the son can love. And then in Romans chapter 15, verse 30, we see that the spirit can love. It says, now I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love that comes from the spirit to join me in my struggle, earnestly praying to God for me. That was Paul writing. But he references the love that came from who? The spirit. Okay. So intelligence, will of their own, can love. Can they speak? Okay. Yeah. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. Then a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. I am pleased with him. That was the father speaking. Everybody there heard it. Okay. It says they were like, whoa, you know. Then in Luke chapter 5, verse 20, obviously we have the son speaking. Now, obviously the whole gospels are about the son speaking. But when Jesus saw their faith, he said, mister, your sons are forgiven. ISV again says mister. So it's a little odd, but obviously Jesus spoke. That was pretty, pretty evident. But then in Acts 8, 29, we see the Holy Spirit speaking. It says, the spirit told Philip, approach the chariot and stay near it. And that was when the Holy Spirit teleported Philip to the <laughs> chariot with the uh, Ethiopian eunuch who was studying the scriptures. Didn't he run up to the thing and then teleported somewhere else after? Oh, he teleported after you, right? I'm sorry. I just like the teleport part. You know? right. Teleportation's in the Bible. Poof, poof. Okay, so, um, so yeah, but the Spirit told Philip. Now, again, if the Holy Spirit was just electricity in the wall, you know, it, it, how could it talk? But here we have speaking, the speaking ability attributed to the Holy Spirit. So, intelligence, will, can love, speak. How about just in general having feelings, right? In Genesis 6.6, 6, the father, it says, then the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and he was deeply grieved about it. We had a question a few weeks ago about the, the term Lord. Like when we say Lord, are we referencing Jesus or the father? The answer is yes. Well, which one? Yes. Okay. And this is a good example right here where God, the father is being referenced as Lord. Okay. Um, John chapter 11, verse 35. Obviously we know that Jesus had feelings because this is the uh, what people say is the shortest verse in the Bible, right? <coughs> and Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. Yes, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so John eleven thirty five, we see Jesus weeping, right? Jesus wept over his friend who had died. Okay, he had feelings, right? But then, what about the Holy Spirit? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, and Chris, you mentioned this earlier. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. How do you grieve an energy? You can't. But the Holy Spirit is not just energy. He is a person and therefore can be grieved. You can hurt his feelings. You can bum him out. Okay. Um. And then I'm not going to go back through the whole chapter again, but if you go back and read uh, John chapter 14, you see that Jesus speaks of the Father as he, okay? You see that Jesus speaking of the Holy Spirit as he, and you see that Jesus speaking of himself as I. That's identity and self-awareness, all right? So, personhood. It's it's established in Scripture, okay? It, it's pretty clear. And then the... The one to kind of encapsulate all of this, you know, is uh, the Great Commission. You guys know that, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. It says, Therefore, as you go, disciple people in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Did it say names? No, it said the name, singular, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so, um, and that's kind of it, guys. That was like real short. Yeah. I get kind of confused because um, I know we're talking about personhood and how they all have personhood characteristics. Yes. But the son is the only one that we can physically see because though our father, God, 
still individual persons? Yes, they are individual persons. Um, having the, the the question was is, um, and when we talk about the Trinity, is like is the Son the only one that had a physical a physical presence that we could see and touch? And the answer is yes. Um, Jesus, the Son, is the only person of the Godhead that came and clothed himself in flesh, is what the Bible says. That he, that he entered humanity through being born of the Virgin and was born as a human, lived a life as a human. And, and that's where we were talking about, that, that dual nature. That, that God the Son is the only one of the Trinity that had a dual nature. He was 100% fully God, but at the same time, he was 100% fully human. He wasn't 50% God and 50% human. He was both simultaneously. Okay, the hypostatic union. Uh, that's what I think it is. I might have said that earlier. Um, but God, the Father, the Bible tells us in many places, nobody has ever, ever seen him nor can see him. Right? Um, Moses, when he was up on the mountain, you know, God's presence passed by him. Right? God had to hide him in a cleft of the rock, you know, and Moses is like, just let me see you, let me see you. And he's like, bro, your eyeballs will burn out of your head and you'll die, right? And he's like, but come on. And so he's like, all right, all right, let me hide you in the cleft of the rock here. And then I'm going to pass by and then you can see my afterglow, all right? And it says, I'm paraphrasing the story, obviously, but it says that that afterglow, like, grayed out his hair and like and he was like shining like when he came down from the mountain he was literally glowing with they call it the shekinah glory of god um um and that was just the the after presence of god passing by him now we say did did god the father pass by physically at that point um his presence passed by um i wouldn't say it, it wasn't a physical body you know when they built the temple in the old testament it says that the presence of God came like a cloud and engulfed the temple. You know, um, when they were on Mount Sinai, it says that the presence of God engulfed the whole top of the mountain in like a cloud. And so we have these analogies of God's presence being there. Um, when the when the Jews were fleeing from Egypt, it says that God appeared as a uh, a pillar of fire at night, and a, I think it was a pillar of smoke. Is that right? Or a cloud by day, and that was God. But, I mean, you know, big pillar of fire, you know. So, you know, obviously he's God. God can manifest in any way or form he chooses. At the same time, throughout the Old Testament, we have these things called uh, Christophanies, all right? Appearances of Jesus Christ or appearances of the Son, God the Son. Um, we have, um, I, I did a whole study on this on Monday night, so I'm not going to recap the whole thing, but... There is um, the angel of the Lord is referenced in the Old Testament, usually like, you know, showing up to, you know, kick butt or, you know, encourage the, the Jews and stuff. And there's scriptures that tie all that together that say that was an appearance of God the Son in the Old Testament. Now he appeared as an angel, okay? Um, but it was in a form that the people recognized as, oh, hey, look, the captain of the host kind of thing. Uh, the Holy Spirit, as far as I know, um, doesn't ever appear in any bodily form outside of during the baptism of Christ appeared descended on Jesus in the form of a dove. All right. And some people even argue, well, what do you mean in the form of a dove? You know, did it look like a bird, you know, hey, caw -caw, come down or, or was it just kind of like this white, like kind of billowy form that kind of fluttered down, you know, I don't know. I just know what the Bible says. Okay. <laughs> so what, what that means exactly, I'm not exactly sure, you know, um, but it was whoever, well, Matthew, who wrote that gospel, you know, um, his reference when he says it descended in the form of a dove, I think it was Matthew. Anyways, it was enough for him to go, hey, it looked like a dove. So, um, so yes, the, there is a scripture and I was going to write it down because I knew you were going to ask and I forgot to write it down. So I don't remember the scripture, but we referenced it a few weeks, a few weeks ago where it says God is spirit. All right. Um, I'll look that up for you and find it for you so, so you can have that reference. So yes, God is spirit, but he also, the person of the son came and became man as well. If, if God is a spirit, why is there a separate spirit, a holy spirit? Why, why can't it just be two? <laughs> okay. So you're 
in that question, she said, if, if God is spirit, then what is the Holy Spirit? Like, are they two different spirits? Okay. That goes back to, to the same question of what the Trinity is. There is one God. Okay. Um, when it says Holy Spirit, and uh, I'll look into this as well, but like other denominations, especially, um, I believe it's Catholics, they call them the Holy Ghost. All right. Um, and the, the word spirit is, um, is the word, uh, I think it's pneuma. Okay. It means wind or breath of God. Okay. And, but it's used to reference the person of the Holy Spirit, you know, this breath of God, this wind of God, if you will. But as we looked in scripture tonight, it's like, but this, this wind, this breath using that word, if you will, has feelings has a will, it is a person, okay? So when we're, we're talking about the attributes of personhood, that doesn't necessarily mean physical body, okay? Um, what it means is identity, self-awareness, the ability to feel, the ability to speak, those types of things. And so when we say God is spirit, um, God's nature, God's form is, is, is everywhere at all times, you know? He's not confined to one physical location outside of the fact of when God the Son came to the earth and dwelt and confined himself to the form of a man. But God is everywhere. God is omnipotent. God is all these things. And the Bible talks about all these attributes of God. So when it says he is spirit, he's, he's intangible, if you will. You know, uh, like Romans, it says we see who God is. His, his attributes are seen in his creation, you know. But the Godhead itself, you know, we don't say, hey, God's over there in that building you know, or God's sitting over there right now. God's everywhere, you know. Um, so when we say God is spirit and then the Holy Spirit, it's God's nature as one God is spirit. That he's not a physical being as God, all right. But at the same time, one of the persons of the Trinity did clothe himself in flesh and give himself a physical body. So when I say God the Father is spirit, God the Son is spirit, God the Holy Spirit is spirit, okay? It's not saying they're two different spirits. It's just talking about his, his, his essence, his nature, who he is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Trying to describe it as best I can. Well, yeah, and that, that's that's my favorite verse, you know, because, again, and like I said earlier, you know, trying to define an infinite God is, is largely impossible, you know. Yet God gave us His word to say, "This is who I am. This is what I'm like. This is my heart. This is my the, my my how I feel about things. This is what I want. This is how you know all of these things about Him, you know." Um, but yeah, we have that verse in Isaiah. It was Isaiah, right? Is we established that a couple weeks ago. My th thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. Is that Isaiah? And verses like that, I believe, are there because people tend to get to a place where they say, if I cannot fully comprehend this thing called the Trinity, then God, therefore, must not exist. And that's false logic. Because just because you can't fully comprehend something does not mean it doesn't exist, right? I mean, how many of you fully comprehend nuclear physics, right? Yeah, how many of you fully comprehend the, 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 the physics of gravity? I don't. I just know it works, right? I know if I jump off a building, I'm going to hit the ground and it's going to hurt. Now, can I get into the, the quantum fields and all this stuff about... No. But that doesn't mean it ceases to exist simply because I don't understand it, you know. For a lot of things in, in my faith, it's the same thing with me. I, kn I know the Bible. The Bible says it's true, and that's why I believe it. Can I fully understand all of it? No. And, and I don't think we're expected to because, again, if we could fully comprehend all of the dimensions of God, well, then how limited is he, right? We are his creation, not the other way around, you know. He is, he is, like we said, he's all knowing. He's all places at all times. He's almighty. He's, 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 he exists in past, present, and future simultaneously. We don't. We exist in one dimension of time. That's present. He exists in all of them at the same time, right? 
he exists in all in all spans of everything at the same time. For us to to think we can comprehend that fully, I think, is just a fallacy. It's it's pretty arrogant to go, oh yeah, I could get that. No, we can't. You know. There you go, John four twenty four. Knowing that the Spirit dwells in us. Yes. Does the Trinity dwell in us? Very good question. The question is this. We know that the Spirit dwells within us, but then that does that mean the Trinity dwells within us? What do you guys think? No. Yes, no. Okay. <laughs> Right. It, it's, why do you say yes? Because whether we understand it or not, he controls the cells, the molecules, the way they orbit around our heartbeat. Yeah. And even all those impulsive thoughts that come into our mind. But then the Bible says we have to filter out what is good, what is bad. Okay. Okay. Chris? We, we know we're the temple of God. So God, just, just like in the temple in, in Time of the Israelis, where the Israelites had a temple, and God dwelt there, but not physically. His presence was there, and God obviously can't physically dwell within us, but I feel His Spirit is in us, and we're the temple of God. And I don't really know where I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, um, somewhere there's a scripture that says, Something about we we know like the spirit or we know Jesus is with you for your love for one another or we know that you're a Christian. Because oh, it says the the world will will know you're my disciples oh, okay. because of your love for one another. Right. Um, well, anybody else? Anybody have any thoughts? What do you think, Don? You asked the question, my so you have to answer it. Was just <laughs> when Jesus said, "I will never leave you nor forsake you." Right. Well, Jesus did say, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But he did also say, I'm leaving and will send another helper. Yeah. Which, which I guess, or didn't he say that it was better? He said, it's better for you if I go, yeah. for then the Holy Spirit will come. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> They're the same, yeah. but not the same. Yeah, That's why it's kind of a yes and a no. Yeah, it, it's a yes and no. Okay, from... from from the perspective of they are all God. So all three spirits. <laughs> yeah, right? There's not three spirits there. Three persons, one God. I have a question that's kind of a little different topic. Okay, let me finish my thought on this and then we'll okay. get to that question. So the Bible says that Jesus was, was resurrected from the dead. Then he ascended to heaven and is now at the right hand of the Father. Which indicates that the Father is in heaven and the Son is in heaven. And our dogs are barking at something outside. So, Father is in heaven. Son is at the right hand of the Father in heaven. The Son went to heaven and then sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. So, based on that, I would say, no, the Trinity does not dwell within us. The person of the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Who is God. So then, by extension... It's, it's, again, it's going back and forth at the distinction between one God, three persons. I was just going with this basically, basically basing it off the concept of the parts of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say no. I would say no to that, you know. Um, I would now, of course, without going back and studying this, you know, further, but when Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, he was right because he's God. And God was going to dwell within us. But God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, yeah. does not dwell within us. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, dwells within us. Um, what, we, what we didn't get into is that even though there are three persons of the Trinity that are co-equal, that are the same, one's not inferior to the other, which some of the cults teach, there is a hierarchy that exists within the Trinity. Okay, Where um, it's, it's the Father... 
Uh, how do we put this? Dang it, I can't remember it. Father saves, grants things, father saves, son redeems, redeems and Holy Spirit points. Sanctifies. I think that's what it was. I'll have to look that up to be sure. But if you if you look at the hierarchy, is the Holy Spirit is always pointing to Jesus, never to himself, right? He's pointing at Jesus, pointing at Jesus, pointing at Jesus. And that's why we go, oh, Jesus, Jesus lives within me, you know? Which I've had times in my walk where I'm like, no, he doesn't. He's at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit dwells within me, you know? Why don't we pray to the Holy Spirit more? He's the one that's with me right now in this room, which technically <laughs> that's true, right? The Holy Spirit is the one that's in us right now. The second person, the, the Trinity, is with the Father in heaven right now. But they're, they're God. They're, they're all by nature God, right? So God is with me and God is in heaven because God is everywhere, right? But the Holy Spirit never draws attention to himself, you know? He doesn't say, pray to me. He doesn't say, focus on me. He says, focus on Jesus. Oh, yeah, he, he said he ever lives to make intercession for you, you know, that um, the Holy Spirit will will make utterance on your behalf. You know, I'm talking about praying in the spirit and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I've always had this idea that it's like, I don't know what to pray for. So the Holy Spirit here prays. And this is where you get the idea of praying in tongues, speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues is a different gift. But praying, praying in a language you don't know. Um, God understands that. And the son is, is there interceding for us going, hey, dad, father, listen to this prayer. And, you know, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but why should I listen to their prayer? I died for them. My blood covers all their sins. They have access, you know. So there's this kind of hierarchy of of role, if you will, in how it works together. Again, that's that's a whole nother mm -hmm. deep study on its own that we don't have time to get into tonight. But but we do see this um, submission, you know, where where the son said, uh, Jesus said while he was here on earth, he goes, I've never done anything that the Father didn't tell me to do. Right? There was a submission to the Father's authority. So, Chris, you had a question. Okay, so back to Jesus. Yes. And back to, like, intelligence. Okay. And, and um, to roughly explain it, we, we know that Jesus came in human form and gave up some things. But as, as far as to what extent did he give up things, because um, when he talks to different groups, he, he knows what they're thinking, is, is that, and then he will ask them a question. Um, and read throughout the Gospels, um, he sent his disciples ahead of him, and then he met them there. Or it, it kind of, for me, it kind of seems that, um, you know, when, when they go to, um, I forget where it was, he, he, he cast out all the demons into the swine. Did, did Jesus know that there was a guy there that had to have demons cast out? Or did he just, did he just go and, oh, here's a guy that needs to be, have demons cast out? Does he know, like, can he read minds? Or Did he uh, have, you know, omnipotence? Here on earth as Jesus the Son. Have really good perception of what, what my disciples are, are arguing about. Yeah, or was he just really lucky, right? And just happened to like, whoa, that, there's a demon possessed dude here. I just happened to show up, right? Um, well, I I believe that he. It, it says in the Gospels that he he uh, grew in wisdom and stature, right, as a man. Meaning, meaning that he subjected himself submitted himself he didn't shed his divinity he didn't give it up but he subjected that to the uh um, submitted that to the father meaning the father will um reveal what what he needs to reveal to me in his time right he's doing his father's role so he was born as a baby right and we talked about that when jesus was born as a baby you know the the second person of the trinity you know came through all of existence and, shh, and zoomed down and then boop popped out as a baby he wasn't just like, wow, I am God, all-knowing creator of the universe in this little chubby baby body. This is an interesting experience, you know. 
That was what? He was a baby. He was, you know, couldn't hold his head up and all that kind of stuff. And then he learned and he grew and he matured. Personally, I believe that it was when he was, uh, it was about 12. We have that one story of where they, they went to Jerusalem and, and, you know, the parents left and he was talking to them. I personally believe I was, I think it was there that he realized or it was revealed to him, however you want to look at that, that he was God. His that he was, yeah, his self awareness that he was God. But, but, does that mean that he was all of a sudden instantly like, boom, all knowing of all things, and pew, pew, you know, I believe he still grew and matured. And I still believe that as he was submitted to the father, the father had him grow and mature and he, he, things were revealed to him or he grew in that as he got older. Now, I do believe that there was a point where as, as a fully grown man in his ministry, that he was fully exercising his divinity. You know, we have the stories where he just passed through the crowd, Right everybody's like ah jesus jesus and then he just all of a sudden they're like where'd he go you know he just passed through the crowd right um you know we we have we have stories like that where he yeah he knew what they were thinking you know and constantly knew what the pharisees were thinking you know and and it tells us the, exactly those types of things where they would ask a question and then he'd ask another question and it would cause them to shut up because he knew what was in their hearts stuff like that where i do believe that in his adult ministry um being fully aware of his his divinity you know and and then being fully aware of his mission because i do believe that's kind of what the the baptism and going to the wilderness was all about was it was the beginning of okay i mean i'm i'm ready to start doing what i was here to do you know um that he he was in a sense reading minds he was in a sense able to go i know what you're thinking i know what's in your heart and so i don't think it was just that he was um you know uh, lucky just happened to show up at a certain place or that kind of thing. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't know if it was a question or not. So it's my, my good friend, pastor Mike Winger giving me some, uh, tips on the stream here. Um, but it wasn't anything that we were talking about. So I'll address it later, but he did say, and you should turn off your phone while you're in the study. Cause he could hear the blinking through the stream. So, Yes, thank you, Pastor Mike. <laughs> um, so anyways, I, I do believe he was exercising his divinity. He was aware of it. He was, he was consciously doing those things. I don't, I don't think he was just, you know, having to show up. Um, but I do believe he was being guided by the Spirit, right? Because again, he was there as the Son. I'm submitted to the Father and the Holy Spirit came upon me to empower me for ministry. You know, that was all that stuff that we talk about today, um, about the Holy Spirit come upon us. And then he was led by the Spirit, you know, because it said the Spirit led him into the wilderness. And I believe that was something that characterized his entire ministry, that he was led by the Spirit, you know. And so, hey, shh. Yeah, we should hide the dogs next time. Um, so, yeah, I believe it was he, was he was cognizant and aware of his divinity and exercising those things under the submission of the Father as led by the Spirit. So. Okay? Okay. All right, guys. We made it. 45 minutes. So, um... Obviously, this is a topic that that entire seminary courses are taught on, entire semesters go over, volumes and volumes of books have been written on the Trinity. I have attempted to cover it in a, in a simple way in two, two Bible studies, and so I, I hope this has brought some measure of understanding to you guys of what the Bible teaches out the Trinity. Um, like I said, it's, it's a topic you can study for forever. And I encourage you to do that, you know, in your own devotions and stuff is get into the word and just say, hey, Lord, just teach me this and show me, you know, and you'll see it all over the place. I mean, literally, when you go through, you're going to see, oh, hey, there's a Trinity again. Hey, there's a Trinity again. Hey, hey, hey. And especially through the Old Testament, and the New Testament, it's, it's really a fascinating topic. But but the idea of, of it being a very important doctrine to Christianity is is kind of the big idea. It is foundational, you know, a correct view of who God is is critical to Christians, right? An incorrect view of who God is, is why we have cults, all right? They have an incorrect view of who God is. And so, um, and like we said earlier, they deny the Trinity. They deny God's nature as taught by the Bible. And they even go so far as to make up their own translations of the Bible to prove it and so on and so forth. And so, um, but it's important for us because in the concept of the Trinity, um, it's only in that concept, in the doctrine of the Trinity, what the Bible teaches about it, that we can really have the true incarnation of, of God, the Savior, which this is what it's all about, right? 
the gospel. God came to this earth, lived as a man, without sin, died on the cross for our sin, was buried, rose again, defeating death forever. And through that sacrifice, through his shed blood, if Jesus is not God, none of that matters, right? If he's just, uh, well, he's, you know, Elohim's son, as the Mormons say, the brother of Lucifer. And, uh, well, the, if, if he's anything less than what the Bible teaches him to be, then, then our faith is founded on lies and falsehoods, and, and it doesn't matter. There is no salvation, right? So understanding that who God is, as the Bible declares him to be, is important. It's a, it's a critical part of our faith. Does it mean you have to be an expert theologian on discussing, you know, the depth of the Trinity? No. You know, but you at least have to understand the Bible teaches the Trinity. It is true. God is a Trinity. He is one God existing as three persons. Why? Because the Word of God teaches that. Now, we're going to get into this in another Bible study is why do we believe the Word? Why do we go? It, if Bible says it, I believe it. There are reasons for that, and we're going to get into that in another study. So um, with that, guys, let's uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer, and um, we'll wrap this up. So, um, but before I do that, as I've said in this Bible study before, guys, um, hitting these things topically, if you guys have any questions that you go, hey, I would love to hear a Bible study on this. I would love to dig into this topic. Um, <clears throat> you could do a couple things. You could text me the question, okay, and I'm kind of just creating a database of questions you guys want to go over. Or uh, if you're watching online, please leave it in the comments. You could post it in the comments underneath, and we'll try and address those questions as well. And, um, and just let me know. Now, in, in the event that we have no specific topical questions you guys want to go over, we're going to be, um, we'll be going through the book of Titus as a book study, and then we'll be taking breaks as questions come up with that. So, all right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, so much for <coughs> who you are. God, who you are is foundational to our faith, God. And, and your word reveals who you are, your very nature, God. And Lord, although we may not fully comprehend this concept of the Trinity and not fully comprehend, you know, how it all works together, Lord, we can rest on the truth that your, your word says it. Your word teaches it. Your word is very clear without contradicting itself that there is one God, but there are three distinct persons within that Godhead. And yet you are God, one God, Lord. God, we, we believe it by faith. We hold on to it, Lord. And we know that it's because you are God, you were able to come and die for our sins as a perfect sacrifice. That God, through our faith in you as God, we have salvation. And that through the promises that you made as God, Lord, we live now with you as our counselor and our, and our, and our guidance. Lord, and we have the hope of heaven to be with you forever when we pass on this life, Lord, and we thank you for that, Lord. So especially, God, as we move into Easter to celebrate the resurrection of God the Son, Jesus Christ, that we remember, Lord, the, the, the significance of all that you are and what it means to our lives, Lord. We thank you, God. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.